Well, this evening we have Kevin McCants with us, who is a painter and an art teacher here in the Conejo Valley. Thank you so much for joining me. Well, thank you for having me. I'm uh, excited to be here. So let's get right into it. So tell me about yourself. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Columbus, Ohio. Mm -hmm. um, I am the youngest of eight. Mm -hmm. I oh. have three older brothers, four sisters, and I'm the baby boy. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I left Ohio to go to art school in Pennsylvania. I went to the Art Institute of Pittsburgh and I studied fashion illustration and commercial art. And then after school, I ended up leaving the art field altogether and spending a lot of time making music and beach hopping basically in South Carolina until I came to California to beach hop where I ended up staying. <laughs> that was 30 years ago. How did you get into fashion illustration? Well, first job I ever had, mm -hmm. I've always drawn and I've always painted. Okay. Um, and since the age of six, I was drawing and painting and my parents put me through art school as opposed to giving me, you know, musical instruments because it was quieter. Mm -hmm. uh, you didn't make as much noise with a crayon and a pencil than you could with a guitar or a keyboard or drums. Right, so, I know how that is. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so I started taking drawing lessons at six and um, the first job I ever did was in the summertime at a store called York Fashions where my sister was the assistant manager. Mm -hmm. And I needed a summer job, so I decided to get out of the house and go to work with my sister. Mm -hmm. And it was a fashion store. What actually happened was they wanted to do some ads, so they wanted me to kind of draw some things for them. And mm -hmm. so I ended up drawing things for them, and, and I was maybe 15. Uh, and then I just kind of caught on. I just kept doing it until I ended up going to art school where I started doing the same thing. That's like right place, right time, like the timing of things. I love that. So where do you find that you get most of your inspiration from? Well, it comes to me. Um, for example, the, the, one of the series that we're going to talk about later on, the Bergdorf Goodman series, was an idea I had when I was sitting on my, my back porch. And I'm looking into the house through the French doors and I'm catching a reflection from outside. I'm catching the image of the house on the inside. And my first thought was, oh, that's pretty cool. How do I paint that? And do I want to paint this? And then ultimately, when you think about these things and it stays in your head, the actual images of what you want to paint always come to you. You always find them. So the Bergdorf Goodman series was, you know, uh, the from the Met mm -hmm. when 2012 when they had the Chaos to Couture show at the Met, mm -hmm. and the images were there, and were snapping photographs, 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 tons of photographs, mm -hmm. and through the photographs that thought that I had that's been perking, percolating in my brain, you know, came out. It was like, hey, these are the images. These are the images that I wanted to do. And that started off the whole series of reflection paintings. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, just from that one day sitting on my porch asking myself, how do I do this? And, and what am I gonna do? All of these images came. Like, what was the time frame with that? Well, let me, let me start it this way. Okay. I had the idea. It took me a couple of years mm -hmm. to actually find the imagery. Um, but I wasn't immediately ready to paint. Mm -hmm. Because the first thing I had to figure out was how was I going to do these paintings? You, there are process, there's a process that you go through. I mm -hmm. think the first painting that I did took me... Um, almost six months. Mm -hmm. The second painting came easier. The third came even quicker. So 
from, you know, the first one to the 10th one took me probably three years. You start to find shortcuts in your process to get you where you want to go faster. Mm -hmm. uh, and some paintings don't lend themselves to specific techniques um, and others do. So mm -hmm. I had to, I had to basically fail a lot. There's a whole bunch of other paintings that I started that are, you know, a part of that series that just didn't make it. They just, I just didn't like them. So in total, there's probably about 20 to 25 in the first series, mm -hmm. 15 of those, I, 10 to 15 of those I would never use, never show, probably paint over <laughs> at some point. So I'm really curious about how you, just that process of being patient with yourself. There's an understanding that I have that I teach my students is that you're gonna fail more than you succeed. Mm -hmm. But if you stop, or you give up, you'll never succeed, ever. You'll never have one good painting if all, if if your first 10 are bad and you're in such a hurry to get them done, you mm -hmm. can't rush it, it comes. You know, I, there was a, I, there's a, there's a saying that I had that I, I wrote for one of the songs that I made, it's called creativity comes in spurts. Sometimes it's beautiful, other times it hurts. Mm -hmm. And it's true. It's because very true. It is. You, you, you can reach a point where you're just absolutely frustrated. Just, mm -hmm. just ugh, have the worst day of your life painting. And then the next day, it could just be so easy. So patience is one of my strong suits. I, you know, I have, I have people who, <laughs> you know, students are very difficult because they want to be really good now you know right. they want that painting finished now but I'm very process oriented and I can slow them down and walk them through it so I can do the same thing with myself and mm -hmm. you know so did someone tell you or share with you that kind of like this is the process yeah well the create can be lonely until you find other people mm-hmm there are a lot of community art communities where people get together and critique each other's work. I'm not a fan of that because I, I, I'm not a fan of other people having input to my direction. Mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't mean that it's wrong at all. And right. so I learned early on that if you want to do something and you want to do it well, or you just want to do something from beginning to completion, that you have to basically go through the process. My father was a builder, so you know he's the, everything is work until you know you're you're actually done with what you're working on or building, right. right? You don't see all the progress you're making until you're finished. And so all of those things kind of stuck with me. And it makes it so much easier to work towards something when you know that in the end, it's actually going to be what you want it to be if you work at it hard enough right. and long right. enough. Right. Yeah, that's a good life philosophy, not just oh. art. That's life, right? It is. It really is what is your basic philosophy or the, like the thing that you try to make sure that your students are aware of? I want them to be honest. Mm, I love it, yes. I, when you're working towards what you're working towards, just be honest about where you are, where you stand and what it is you're trying to accomplish. Right. Yeah. Uh, can you talk to me about your belief in drawing right the skill of drawing as being foundational i teach that more than i teach anything else because the drawing is more important everything every mistake that every student ever makes goes back to drawing in some way shape or form right so who are your artistic influences my favorite painter of all time john singer Sargent. 
I looked at his work. <laughs> He's good, right? It is. <laughs> he is. Yeah. He encompasses everything that I think a painter should should be. Which is? Well, he has drawing skills that are just absolutely phenomenal. Mm -hmm. He has a sense of color and style, and he can paint anything whether it be landscapes or the, the human body, the human flesh, clothing, which, you know, I have four sisters, so I had to learn a lot about clothing growing up. Um, you know, to create a fine collar or lace or the sheen of a really, really uh, beautiful cloth, he could do it all. And uh, his color palette was just fantastic. Mm -hmm. To get life, life representation in face, the flesh. But not only that, if you look at a Sargent painting, and I've gone to see four of them, three of them so far this year. I went to the Huntington, where they have two. Mm -hmm. um, and I also went to the Hammer Museum, where Dr. Pazzi, um, in the red, you know, smoking jacket um, with the red shoes and the and a frilly collar is mm -hmm. one of the most beautiful paintings I've ever seen in my life. And the thing about it is, it's loose. It's loose. It's so loose that the man could capture like fingers with three strokes, right? We, we sit down and we try to get every stroke correct, every line correct. He could do it with just a flourish of a brush stroke, mm -hmm. which is absolutely amazing. It's so wonderful to see his work up close. It just, it, it, you know, it just makes me happy. I smile. I can tell. I can yeah. tell just by yeah. the way you're talking I, about it. <laughs> wait, this is the guy right here. Mm -hmm. You know, this is the guy for me anyway. So. Right. so what would you say the goal or purpose is for your work before we get into your work? We'll just set it up with this. Like, what, what's your goal? I, I want to share a little bit of me mm -hmm. with the world, uh, you know, a little insight into who I am and how I see the world, how I see things. Mm -hmm. It's a hard, hard thing to share yourself with people. It is. It, it's, it's hard to put it down in words. It's hard to put it on a canvas. It's hard to be open. I want them to look beyond. It's just a nice painting. OK, sometimes they're nice, sometimes they're not. Mm -hmm. But I want you to feel or at least understand where that thought came from or what the meaning of the title of that painting is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, that's a good segue for us to look at some of your paintings. So these paintings are from the Bergdorf Goodman Reflection Collection? Yes. yes. The first four mm -hmm. are from the Bergdorf Goodman Collection. And mm -hmm. this is Mohawk and Window number seven. It, this this painting it really excites me. I really love this painting. Not only that, because of the musical aspect of it too, with mm -hmm. the you know guitar here, if you can actually see it on the left, um, okay. it's a silhouette of a guitar. If I punch in a little closer, you can actually see over here on the right the controls or the volume control. Okay. Some of the string. Yes, I do see it now. You know what? I didn't, <laughs> I was looking at something else thinking I was looking at a guitar and now it's plain as day <laughs> that right? I could see it where I couldn't, I thought I was looking at it, but I wasn't, I was looking at something else. You know what else is interesting to me? And this is like how you, evoke feeling or these are the feelings that I got from this painting. So is this like an older gentleman 
Yes. Like in the street. So in my mind, he has ideas about this person <laughs> that are like, you know, why are they dressed like that? You know, so that kind of thing or those thoughts or those feelings come up for me when I'm looking at this and this person is just like in their own world doing their thing and so it's like having those two kind of uh, juxtaposed is interesting because he would be concerned about this person and this person has no concern he's just he or she is just doing their own thing so exactly that yeah. is that is the, exactly the point um the cars and mm -hmm. the person are looking to the future looking larger mm -hmm. they're larger and looking more towards the future where you have the older gentleman that's looking back. back right and, and that's a metaphor for life because right. we find ourselves in situations like that now where younger generation kids and i'm in the middle i can say but the younger generation are looking way beyond what's happening in the now and uh, you know some of us old people are like, well, that that noise is too loud. Right. <laughs> you know, that, why is that car making that much noise? Yeah. Right, so, right. That's kind of where we find ourselves. And so <laughs> that was that is really the point of this one. And I'm glad you felt that way because that's the emotion I was trying to evoke with this. Mm -hmm. uh, the next one is the jacket and they're along the same lines where um, you have the interior scene. Well, there's actually three things happening here. You have the mannequin uh, in the leather jacket, which is my, you know, I love the fashion aspect of it with the studs because I had a jacket like this mm -hmm. um, and, you know, my past, which is the punk past back here and Doc Barton's, you know, honestly, oh, I, was, nice. I was a really big Prince fan and Rick James and all of those guys. Right. And I also liked The Clash. Mm -hmm. and, and that was the scene for me. Um, mm -hmm. And so this Chaos to Couture show was bringing back all of those good times that I had right. and I really, really, really wanted to capture that. Uh, and so, you know, the image that comes forward, but with the street scene inside of it, uh, and that's kind of my typical work where you put layers upon layers upon layers together to create uh, the feeling that you want. Mm -hmm. you know? the past, the guy on his cell phone here, you know, modern day doing his thing, minding his own business. Mm -hmm. uh, so this next one are the shoes. Now there's a lot that's going on here. These shoes are actually in a window. Mm -hmm. And this painting, it represents lust and want to me. We pass by windows and we look at and we see mannequins in the windows, we see shoes, we see things in the windows and they, they bring that level of desire in us up. I like that. I want that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, those shoes are so cool. Now, with the shoes, I actually painted each and every one of those studs. Oh, wow. And how long does, did that take? Each. <laughs> they, <laughs> oddly enough, the, the studs took the longest. Um, it took me three months to do the studs. Wow. Each one. Mm -hmm. um, I had to get the angles correct. I had to get them going in the right direction. Some of them go as they're turning up but they also had to be sequenced and lined. Mm -hmm. 
And so um, the photograph here kind of flattens them out. Mm -hmm. This was the challenge. I got to paint those studs. I really want to try to, to make this all about the shoes. Mm -hmm. what, what I think about mm -hmm. every time I see this painting is, oh my God, how impractical are those? You know, who's yeah. gonna wear those? And that's what I wanted the image above mm -hmm. to, um, to emote was who's going who's going to want to wear those how would you wear those where would you wear those with what would you wear those right right and the lower image is like oh my god these are fascinating um you can't see her face but right. you know that she's into them and it's so interesting is i put the judgment on from the woman's face that you can see on the woman looking at the shoes versus the judgment on the shoes. And that's not wrong. Okay. Because that's how you saw it. And because of that, that actually adds to the painting for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now I have to say this, I, I, there I have when I'm painting these because I'm using a glazing technique and for anyone who doesn't know what a glazing technique is, it's thin layers of paint, paint where you layer them upon each other. Mm -hmm. um, it takes a long time for the glazing material to dry. So it doesn't dry in two or three days like a, an impasto, which is for a just regular paint out of tube and mixed with a little bit of oil would dry. This has uh, it's wetter, so it takes a lot longer to dry. So usually when I'm glazing, I have three or four paintings going because you can't work on it for at least five days. Okay. So these paintings were, it was this one and the next painting, which is armor. Mm -hmm. um, I was working on the two of these at the same time and a couple of other paintings that didn't work. And I'm not ashamed to say that I have paintings that didn't work. I have lots of them. So because they're necessary to get to the are. ones that do work. And this is armor. Mm -hmm. Again, this is 100% glazing. And when you look at this, um, if I zoom in, you know, honestly, I've never shown this painting. It's a part of them but it's so difficult to photograph because it's so translucent mm -hmm. that you ultimately end up getting a reflection mm -hmm. and flare. And so it's kind of hard to photograph, but I think I managed to get, so if you're looking at this, this is all really, really thin, thin, thin paint. Hmm. See the building structure underneath. Right. It almost, it feels like plastic, how wet and how uh, loose it is. Mm -hmm. So what I had to do to create this painting mm -hmm. was I basically had to paint the building first, and then the whole image that sits on top was glazed on top of it. And I didn't draw it, um, I just started glazing. So this is one of those pictures where you can't draw the image. You have to rely on your skills, your drawing skills in order to get that image on top because it's just thin layers of paint. So I didn't draw it with a pencil. All the old masters use glazing. They would do uh, Rembrandt use glazing. So if you, when you're in art school, sometimes you have to do duplications of other painters. And Rembrandt was one of the painters. Uh, Vermeer used a little bit of glazing, a lot of glazing actually. So. Early on, it was the technique of painters because 
paint was so expensive. Mm -hmm. So what they did was they painted in either black or white, black and white or umber and white or painted in pasto where they would build up the texture. Rembrandt did that a lot. Mm -hmm. It's the technique that you had to learn if you wanted to do a Rembrandt painting, you study, you, you try it, you fail, you try more, you fail more, uh, and it's just thin paint. I can go to the next picture, which is mm -hmm. the Traveler, which is a similar technique to glazing, um, except I'm using washes instead. Washes are are also thin layers of paint, mm -hmm. but they dry faster and you can control them a little more. They have a tendency to get dirty. Um, by dirty, I mean the colors kind of get muddy. Um, but if you're... Do they produce more of a sense of, of texture? Because I feel like this painting has... It seems like there's more texture. And I mean texture of like the actual things that you're painting. Like I'm sensing the leather on this suitcase that's in green. Like I can actually see or imagine kind of what that feels like. Yeah, that's or her skirt also. Like I I feel like I know what that feels like based on the way it's being presented to me. Right. It it does have that sheen and that shine, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yeah. when when it moves into um when you start moving into the colors here, yes, it gives you when you go from the orange to the blue here, it gives you that sense of metallic feeling to it, almost like a rayon that's shiny. Um, and right. that is very much how the, uh, the wash works. Also in the car window over here that sits on top. Which I didn't see until you, <laughs> do you took you did, my you there. I was so, I think for this painting, I'm so, my eyes go to, so like the green in the suitcase, the, um, I don't even know what this really is that she's sitting on, but just like the texture, what it just, what it, like I'm imagining what these things feel like. Well, that's good. Like actually there, like what it would feel like. She's actually sitting on an old steam trunk. Okay. Um, but there's also cars over here. I see that one, yes. And the ones behind it. Um, and, and then ultimately in the painting, there is my, sh my silhouette, mm -hmm. which encompasses, you know, it goes, this is my head up here, goes through and comes down and around and I, I do that quite a bit. I decided to do that quite a bit on the bird th on the uh, humanity series because you know I was at the same time that I'm doing these paintings. I started thinking about different ways to do self portraits. You can add yourself into a painting any way you wanted to. The old masters used to do that too. If they had uh, merry company scenes or they had scenes of a bunch of people, they would pop themselves in there. And so following in the lines of those guys, not calling myself a master painter, but occasionally I like to just throw myself in there. And then I started- As thinking, you should. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and I wanted, I wanted this particular painting to feel like they were traveling, like you're ready to go on the trip with them. Yes, definitely. I'm ready to go. I got my luggage. I got my suitcase. I got my, you know, I got everything I need. I got my binoculars so that I'm ready. I am ready to go. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, 
that's what I wanted this one to feel like. Yeah, now, that's definitely captured in this painting. And then we move on to my favorite painting, my own personal favorite painting. Mm -hmm. This is called um, The Watcher. And I came back to this because I wanted to, I had this image, I found this image haunting, you know? And it, this may sound strange, but we all have a voyeuristic side, mm -hmm. you know, where, where we stand back and we're watching what's going on and we're watching what's happening. Sometimes you go to parties and you just want to, you know, stand back and just watch everything that's unfolding in front of you. Right. And this was a way to do that. Um, and also, I used the browns, the reds, and the mold colors to kind of, you know, to kind of dampen the mood of the painting. Yeah, I was going to say it definitely, it sets a, I was going to use the word tone, but it, mood is the better word. It definitely sets a mood. I said, I need to make this feel closed in. I need to mm -hmm. enclose this, make it tighter, make the space tighter so that when you're looking at the painting, you really get a sense that there's this, this image is watching over everything. So I really cut the painting width in half mm -hmm. and just shrank it down to a smaller size, just, just to create that feeling of um, watching. Mm -hmm. And from the viewer's point of view, they're watching the watcher. Right, you know? you're watching the watcher, <laughs> watching exactly. everything and, else that's going on. Right? Yeah. And so the other thing that happened was I, I said to myself, I can't put too much color in here because I wanted to paint this very colorful at first. And I started with a couple of sketches um, and they just didn't, it just, it was too much. It was too noisy. Mm -hmm. And so I took all of the color out and just kind of left the, the muted browns and pinks. And um, it really works a whole lot better. And then you can see uh, the life going on outside of the window if I pull in a little closer, first you have the couple walking here. Mm -hmm. And then you have the street scene out here. It's just the hillside. It's the whole thing just kind of happening. And the ghost image just looking down on the city and saying, you know, I see you. Right. That's our voyeuristic side coming out. Mm -hmm. You were recently commissioned to create an original painting and it's titled, We Gather. Did you get the title? Well, you know what, let me let you explain kind of what the commission was or is, was, um, and then we can kind of go from there. I love this. This is, we gather. It's a, it's a, the title of a painting. It's also the title of uh, a mini documentary. It's also based on Black Life Santa Monica history. Mm -hmm. um, this is a commission painting by the Orchestra Santa Monica. They also commissioned Derek Skye, who's a world-renowned um, composer, mm -hmm. to create three pieces for the work uh, in conjunction with Orchestra Santa Monica. Roger Kalia, who is the orchestra leader, um, conductor for Orchestra Santa Monica, and 
Phil O'Connahan, and Phil O'Connahan is the filmmaker, and Robbie Jones is the historian. Who are all? We're all a part of this film. It's about thirty minutes long, and it's about how um, the African American community in Santa Monica was once relegated to a specific part of beach and right. then uh, known as the Bay Street Beach. The derogatory term for that would be the inkwell, which is what it was called in its inception. Mm -hmm. And so the story starts there and how just like in Bruce Beach, in Manhattan Beach, they wanted to bring the freeway through. Well, they didn't in Manhattan Beach, but they wanted to bring the freeway through the neighborhood that was a thriving neighborhood in Santa Monica. And once that happened and they redlined it and tore down the homes and tore down everything, um, it, uh, it destroyed the neighborhood. But small pockets, of the African-American community remained and uh, Calvary Baptist Church and a couple of other churches are still there. They're, you know, in their hundredth years. Um, and so this work was commissioned by them. So what I wanted to do with this particular painting is show all the imagery Mm -hmm. from the past and the imagery from the present. Uh, the four people in the sky come from a photograph of Nick Gabaldon or Gabaldon. I'm still mm -hmm. not sure how to pronounce that, but mm -hmm. he was the first African-American surfer. Right. And he's, he's at the top, the gentleman on the top left, um, at the very top of the painting. And these are his friends. Um, and so that's a famous photograph. And the three girls in the beach down here on the beach behind the surfer were also uh, from the past, as well as the young paper boy here. And so those are three very famous images from uh, that time in Santa Monica. I have altered them. Uh, I changed the color of his bow tie and his clothes mm -hmm. and, you know, changed the imagery. So, uh, and so what you have in the center here is a pergola, which was represented, which was to represent where we gather means. And that pergola exists on that stretch of beach here in Santa Monica, it's a little higher and, you know, east of the actual ocean. It sits back on the right, but it's in the exact same spot as where, you know, this view gives you. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I wanted to incorporate, you know, modern life and modern people and, and the past together on Santa Monica. And so I did the whole painting of uh, and speaking of blazing and, and washing, I did both in this painting, actually. I did the whole painting um, of Santa Monica, the mountains, the beach, and there was just that. There were no people, there was no pergola, there was nothing. I did the whole painting of Santa Monica Beach first. Mm -hmm. And then in the process, um, input from others led me to where we are now. With a commissioned project or painting, mm -hmm. who has the final word? Like, when do you know it's done? When I've come to a point in a work like this where if I put anything else in, it becomes tacky. If I leave things out and it makes the painting better or take things out and it makes it better, 
that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. But you never want to put in too much. Too much information is really bad. So I have to balance that. Um, and it's a really hard thing to do when it's not completely your concept. Well, I think you've done a great job. I feel like there's a lot here. There's a lot of history. There's a lot of different um, relationships, emotions, feelings being displayed. What I tried to do was mm -hmm. to uh, present the best face mm -hmm. of the African-American community through um, through this. this. These are things that through it all, we're still happy. We're still, we're still going to be, you know, decent people who want our lives to be better. And we want a sense of community like everyone. We want a place to go where we can be together and we want to have fun mm -hmm. and we want to live and enjoy ourselves just like right. everyone else. It's and like seeing African Americans um, portrayed in just like leisurely, right? Or like just enjoying themselves shouldn't be a rarity, but it, it actually is. And I think the first time I realized that was when I became familiar with Amy Sherald's paintings. Mm -hmm. And it's just like African-American people just being, be, they're on yep. the beach there. And it's, I find it um, like, I find it with this work also for me personally, it conjures a sense of peace within me. Well, thank like, you. Yeah. Well, I, I purposefully made the guy who is the most ghosted image, which is the young man here in the red bow tie, mm -hmm. who's the only one that's actually looking away mm -hmm. to the past. Um, the only person in painting that's not smiling and having a good time. Mm -hmm. So again, that's me you know, having everyone else look this way and then having the one person look in the opposite direction towards the past, that's kind of a thing in, you know, in a lot of my paintings as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, but thank you. I, I, I appreciate the fact that it conjures the emotion and makes you feel the way that it does. That's, mm -hmm. that's, all a painter can really hope for is that he can evoke some sort of painting or evoke some sort of feeling or emotion from the viewer. Yeah. And uh, thank you. I, I'm getting choked up here. You're welcome. <laughs> you are so welcome. Thank you so much for taking the time to go through your work and to share uh, all of the knowledge and experience that you have. It's really appreciated. Well, I certainly did enjoy this and we should do it again sometimes. This is fantastic. <laughs>